Well, kia ora, Carl, and kia ora, everybody. Thank you for, um, well, thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, uh, we did have a Māori fishing conference in May, and one of the speakers that day was Michael Laws. And um, I remember when I, I was talking to Peter Talley, and he says, oh, who have you got lined up? I got, oh, I've got Michael Laws. And he says, what do you want that guy for? Well, you should have heard the Māoris when they said I had Pete Michael Laws. A whole lot of people said, oh, I mean, I'm not going to come and listen to that redneck speak, but uh, most of them couldn't help themselves, and they did come. And at the beginning of... Uh, of Michael Law's um, session, um, we got Ken Mayer to introduce him. And um, <laughs> so Ken, Ken went back to the boxing match for the fight for life that they'd had a year or so earlier. And, um, you know, the judges were crooked, all this sort of stuff. The problem was is that we had some photos of when, when, when Michael Law's on the ground and Ken hit him and looked around to see if anyone had noticed. But um, what Michael Law's said was that he reminded us that he was an MP um, back in 1992 when the Sea Lord deal was done. And he said that when um, uh, Doug Graham and Doug Kidd, Jim Bolger, came to their caucus, he said to them, you know, one of the offshoots of this settlement is that there will be more Māori people working in the fishing industry in years to come. And he reminded us of that and... You know, my take on things is that if you've got more directors on Māori fishing companies which are managing the sale of ace from year to year, that's not the sort of employment that they were thinking of then and it's not the sort that I'm thinking of now. So um, I'm really pleased to have a chance to just talk to you about one or two things. Um, I thought this was going to be easier than, I, than it is. Um, but I thought I'd try and provide a little bit of insight. Late last year, um, there was a press release that said New Zealand's largest industries to participate in skills analysis. Representatives of New Zealand's leading export industries have today announced their participation in a skills analysis designed to provide employment advice to iwi, urban Māori authorities and other Māori-led organisations to help them better assist young Māori into future employment opportunities. The day before that announcement, I was told I was going to chair this panel, and I, I thought it'd be um, a really uh, good exercise, and it has been, um, and work out how are we going to get a whole lot of enthusiastic young Māoris who, who aren't sitting on the couch, they're looking for jobs um, in our cities, in our provinces, and help work out a way to create a conduit to get them from where they are into the jobs that we've got here. Um, well, sorry, the jobs that do exist in these industries. Um, the first task of the group is to undertake a skills analysis of what each industry will require in the future and then try to match up uh, their demand with the supply of labour that we, that we think we have. So Māori people are, uh, in the New Zealand setting, younger. 70% of Māoris are under... 30 years of age. Um, they're more numerous. Um, they're healthier, they're better educated, more diverse, more nationally and internationally integrated and richer than they have ever been in, in our history, in New Zealand's history. And all these trends are going to continue. But at the same time, the relative size of the New Zealand labour market will shrink as people age. Uh, Māori will make up a larger proportion of the workforce. Um, they will be both more valued by and more valuable to the labour market because we're going to need more people to work here. And so Māori, I think, are the futures of our society, our businesses and our economy. Now that might sound like a... Um, I don't know whether you all believe that yet. It's not all good. There's a dismal side of it. The Māori population is ageing. Oh, sorry, New Zealand population is ageing. We don't have enough workers to afford retirement. Uh, that workforce will be more Māori. Now, this is on a slide that says that's dismal. It could be dismal or it could be good. They're less productive than retirees. That's pretty lousy. That's not because they don't want to work. It's just that their productivity isn't as high as it might be. And there's a double squeeze with lower output, fewer workers. And we think that Māori can be 
more productive than retirees. Retirees don't do much. So why is the Māori population growing? We've got um, lower infant mortality. So li life expectancy is measured by the average age of people who die each year from a particular group. There's a lot less um, children dying, still too many for my liking, um, which gives us a much, uh, a much improved life expectancy for Māori. Māori and Pacific Islanders have an above replacement fertility, much more fertile and active in that area than the uh, rest of the population. And there are high and growing rates of partnering outside the ethnic group. So um, Māori men and women marry Pākehā men and women, Pacific Islanders, um, and their kids invariably grow up as Māoris. Another, uh, births per women in 2006, Pacific women had three births, uh, Māori women 2.8, don't know how that works. Uh, New Zealand uh, Europeans, those are Pakyas. Pakyas not a bad word. Uh, 1.9 and Asians 1.5. There's another figure that I think is really important. The average age for Pakya women when they have their first child is 29. The average age for Māori women when they have their first child is 19. Um, that's the average age. So over the next 60 years there's going to be two generations of Pākehās and three generations of Māoris. So they're going to need schools, all those things in a different cycle to what the rest of the country is. Here's a little bit of history. In 1971, there were 152 Māori men who had university degrees and 18 Māori women. 2006... 8,520 Māori men had university degrees and 14,000 very forthright Māori women had university degrees. <laughs> I mean, that's a huge growth in education. So we all know that education underpins the rapid growth of the Māori middle class, but there's also been a rise and a fall in the blue-collar proletariat. So in 1951, if you look at the um, number of, these are Māori professionals um, and blue-collar workers. Uh, the blue-collar workers went up into the, seven, into the 80s and now they've regressed down to 29%. In the years to come, we're going to have these um, these types of people. We're going to have comers, stayers and goners. Um, I think Tony Craig's, his horse is a stayer, isn't it? Is that right, Tony? But um, the comers are the inflows into the labour force. Um, when I'm talking about Māori, these are Māori who will be in the labour market in 20 years' time, so they've already been born. So these are kids who are one to five. The stayers are people in the labour market, not necessarily working, that are between the ages of 20 and 45. And the goners, which will be the cohort outflows, are those of us that are over 45. So we will be exiting um, the um, labour market in 20 years' time. Now what will that mean in New Zealand? The comers, stayers and goners in our, in our country is we're estimating that there will be 1.2 million comers in uh, 20 years' time, of which 25% of them will be Māori. 1.5 million stayers, of which 15%, 230,000, will be Māori. And 1.1 million goners, of which 89% of them won't be Māori. So it seems to me that what we have to be thinking about is how do we prepare this Māori population so that they can be worthwhile comers and stayers to look after you goners. It looks to me like New Zealand needs Māoris and Māoris need New Zealand. Jobs in the past and the future. Um, 
there's been a real change in the sorts of jobs. I mean, like I couldn't have trained for this job uh, when I was going to university or even the high school because it didn't exist. Um, fishing existed in those days, but not the sort of role that, that I've got. So I, I don't know what it's going to be like in the future. But we have some ideas about some of the things that we're going to need in the future. I'm predicting that we're going to be eating in the future. So I think fishing will be a good one. Um, I think dairy is going to be a good one. But if you look at this list here, you can come to your own conclusions about the sorts of jobs that we're likely to have in the future. You know, we're always going to need hairdressers and stuff like that. There's some recent demand patterns. I hope that's not too small, but... Um, you know, these are the demand patterns for the period from 2004 to 2012. And if you slide down that scale to the second to last one, it's got agriculture, forestry and fishing and it says 600. It actually says minus 600 as the demand for uh, labour in that area in the last, how long is that? Eight years, which actually, actually coincides exactly with how long I've been working in the area. <laughs> Hope it doesn't get worse. So in the longer term, uh, we're going to have more service industries, more building for houses and retrofitting the houses we've already got, greater level of of tourism. I mean, I've got this thing here, niche marketing like 3D printers, but I, I mean, that's a hard thing to gauge. I don't know, you know, do, do we all get one of those? Will we need people to show us how it works and then make our own things? Who knows? Um, but I think what our economy is going to um, evolve to is one that has a greater level of primary production manufac uh, based manufacturing in the future. So doing a better job of dealing with the primary produce that we have and exporting that to people in different forms to what we have now. So we won't, we're less likely to be exporting logs, I hope, and maybe we'll be exporting chairs. Um, we're less likely to be f exporting fish block, frozen fish block, and we'll be ex exporting some, I don't know, some cordon bleu things. Um, but... Um, you know, the world's going to change and New Zealand's not going to change it. Uh, we're going to have to roll along with it. Five minutes, eh? Thank you. The current and future challenges. Um, what does NEAT mean? NEAT means not in education, employment or training. So we need a transition process from education into the labour market and at the moment it's not doing as good a job as it can, as it might. For Māori kids, um, I mean, I'm on, the, I'm, on the, I'm the chair of a school board. Uh, too many of those kids are confused, so are their parents, about what NCEA can do for them. Uh, too many of them are chasing credits without understanding uh, what quality education might do for them when they leave school. Productivity in New Zealand's always been a problem. Um, we need to work out how we can produce things better and uh, for the money that we spend on it. There are poor employment outcomes for sole parents and it's much worse than we think. Uh, we have got a system in New Zealand that doesn't do enough, in my view, to discourage sole parents and that it, it teaches young men that they don't need to stick around. Uh, and if they're silly enough to do that, they usually end up being an unskilled male as well. Um, and then there's going to, there is an increasing divide between those who are work rich and work poor and the income gap that that brings with it. So more challenges, the gendered education, we prepare women for some things, we prepare boys for others. Um, there are low returns in tertiary education, so you have to ask yourselves, are we over-educating our young people? Um, I, I, I was listening to this lecture where, where uh, what's his name, Sir Ken, Ken Robertson was saying, you know, the, New, the British and I guess the New Zealand education system is designed to produce university professors um, and if you think about what you were encouraged to do when you were at school you, you can't help but agree with them 
Um, Non-work tested, uh, temporary migration, health related welfare benefits, immigration of the best and the brightest, and cultural and economic development. Now the immigration of the, our best and brightest, I mean it's often a thing that politicians are faced with. With Māoris, if you go to Australia, Māoris are really sought after as workers. Uh, they have gone over there from New Zealand because they are anxious to work and make place for themselves and the Australians recognise them. Kids can get off aeroplanes and get jobs on construction sites in the morning because Māoris have got that sort of reputation in Australia and I wish we had it over here. Um, now my plan when I was set, sent to chair that uh, task force group was I thought, I, I know, I will create a project that we could put a thousand young Māoris into a thousand dairy jobs in the South Island and it'll be a piece of cake. Now Jeff's made some really good points and one of his colleagues, Tony, was the same. It's not as easy as that. Um, the comers, the stayers and the goners shows us that the picture for New Zealand uh, labour market's much more different to what we thought it was and we need to put some real thought into how we're going to prepare um, our young population for, our, uh, for its role in looking after our ageing population. So uh, I think that the prevailing approach in New Zealand where we think we can just import people to take, take on all the skilled jobs that we need when we need them isn't going to last forever and we need to work out a way that we can take advantage of, of what we do have, shape it for what we do need and uh, uh, make the best of what our future might look like. My last comment, I'm sorry I didn't have the answers to all of this employment thing, I mean you know, all I've got is the problems. Um, please come to the Māori fishing conference. It's okay, we're, we're, we're bicultural aren't we Tim? Uh, the Māori Fishing Conference is going to be in the last week of March 2014 at the Novotel Hotel um, out by the airport. Uh, you're all welcome. If you don't come, we'll talk about you. Tēnā <laughs> koutou.